Okay, so as I was promising before, I'm going to start off with a little piece of music, just as a, a change of pace. This is the biggest ringing song in Hawaii, everybody. Let's everybody sing together, all right? Repeat after me whenever I say. All you got to say is Pearly Shell, all right? Pearly Shell. Pearly Shell. From the ocean. Ocean. Shining in the sun, shining in the sun, covering the shore, covering the shore. When you see them, when you see them, I'll tell me I love you more than all the liberation. Oh, I'm stuck. Okay, all right, so just that was just a little excerpt. There's actually a dance that goes with it, and I, I guess I should have done it, but you know, but not that, not, not that kind of, not that kind of, uh, I'm not feeling that comfortable with this talk just yet. <laughs> but just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard that song before? It's like a, hand, a few of you? Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who haven't heard it before, uh, the song Pearly Shells, it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a popular sort of lounge song. It's the kind of song you might hear now, I guess, at a tiki bar. Uh, it was originally written in the, the English versions that you see here. I have the, the English lyrics up here. Those were written by a uh, American radio producer in the 1930s named Webley Edwards. Um, he put together the popular radio show Hawaii Calls. And so this is one of the big songs for Hawaii Calls. Uh, it was covered and then further popularized by a number of singers in the 1950s and 60s, most notably by the Hawaiian Chinese lounge singer Don Ho, who that was the version that you just heard. Um, and as you can see here, like the English lyrics are very generic. They're very kind of universal. They're about shells on the beach and being in love. Um, but they could really be about any kind of shells on any beach, any person, right? Um, uh, so, and that's part of what kind of made it such a popular song is that anybody can listen to it and imagine themselves on the beach with someone that they love, right? Uh, any beach. Uh, but the melody of the song itself, uh, the, the song, the, what the song is based on, is based on actually an older Hawaiian song. Um, and it's about this very specific place. It's this place called Pu'uloa, which is now known as Pearl Harbor. Uh, and that mele is the Hawaiian lyrics that you hear in the second verse. Right. So if you don't know the Hawaiian language, you might assume, uh, because there's no translation, right, that the lyrics that you hear correspond with the English ones, right? It's just a straight translation, uh, but that's not the case. Um, it's a very different song. Uh, so the original land is about the famous land of, the original song is about the famous land of Pu'uloa, whose waters are guarded by a powerful female shark goddess named Ka'aho, Ka'ahau Pauhau, sorry. Uh, before it was appropriated by the U.S. Navy in 1887 for use as a coaling and repair station, Pu'uloa was best known as a place where Kanakamale cultivated crops and maintained fish ponds. It was a fertile estuary that served as the breadbasket for the Eva, which is like the central uh, and western region of the island. Uh, so the love expressed in the original song is thus not the human-centered romantic love of two people meeting on the beach, but a very specific song about a community's love for this particular place, its bounty, and its fruitfulness. Uh, this melee may also contain specific knowledge about agricultural or aquacultural practices that were learned and passed down through the generations. Um, but as uh, scholar John Osorio points out, many of these lessons were lost when the Navy dredged the harbor, transformed the terrain, and made many areas off limits to mil non-military personnel. Um, so since then, the bay formerly known as Pu'uloa has gone from being celebrated as a place of sustenance and life to a place that has become more synonymous with warfare and death. Um, that's because modern day Pearl Harbor is of course, right, most closely identified with the infamous surprise attack by Japanese troops that precipitated the US's entry into World War II. 
uh, an event that is officially commemorated every year, like next week or in a couple of weeks, right? Uh, and continues to draw over a million tourists to the wreck of the USS Arizona every year. Uh, while the official memorialization of Pearl Harbor tends to frame this attack as an exceptional and galvanizing event for US history, its tragic legacy long preceded December 7th, 1941 and continues well into the present day. Uh, cultural critics and demilitarization activists Kyle Kajihiro, Terali Kekoolani, and Bernadette Gonzalez regularly point out the ways that the history of Pearl Harbor was profoundly entangled with the events leading up to and supporting the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the ongoing dispossession of Kanaka Maoli. Uh, ideally positioned in the center of the Pacific Ocean, Pearl Harbor served as an important site of trans-Pacific commerce and was scouted out as a potential military acquisition as early as 1873. The strategic importance of Pearl Harbor no doubt played a role in bringing the USS Boston and a landing party of Marines to support the planter-led coup that brought an end to the Hawaiian rule in 1893. That's a picture of the troops of the USS Boston disembarking at Pearl Harbor shortly after the coup. Right. Um, it was a significant factor as well in the United States' decision to annex uh, the islands as a U.S. territory five years later. Uh, following annexation, Pearl Harbor ultimately came to play an important role in the U.S.'s overseas war efforts, which continued to expand after World War II as the U.S. engaged in the lengthy prosecution of Cold War conflicts in Asia. Pearl Harbor's central importance to the U.S. military's global presence continues to this day as Pearl Harbor remains headquarters to the United States Pacific Fleet, which deploys ships throughout the Indo-Pacific region. And obviously here in San Diego, we have a, that Navy connection out there to Pearl Harbor. Um, a lot of the people in, you know, stationed here and the people stationed in Pearl Harbor, right? It's, it's kind of a direct pathway. Uh, so these overlapping histories of native dispossession, American national trauma and global militarization are all intertwined with a material legacy of environmental damage and toxicity that has rendered Pearl Harbor one of the most highly polluted sites in the United States. All right. While the so-called black tears of the USS Arizona, which is the oil that continues to leak from the wreck of the USS Arizona, um, it's operated as a poetic metaphor, I guess, for the death and destruction of that day. Uh, they also quite literally contribute to a growing plume of leaked gas and oil beneath the harbor's surface that, uh, if disrupted, could cause long-term or permanent damage to the shoreline. Uh, yet the spilled oil is only one of many sources of toxic wastes that pollute the harbor. Designated a Superfund site in 1991, the EPA's hazard ranking system lists Pearl Harbor as the 12th most hazardous site in the nation given the possibility of mass exposure to a number of hazardous substances and volatile organic compounds uh, from military landfills and storage facilities in the area that may be spread through the soil, the groundwater, and the atmosphere. Um, these toxins have already entered the food chain, so it's not only what could happen, but what is happening. Uh, in a study performed in 1998, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry performed a study that found fish and shellfish from Pearl Harbor uh, contained abnormally high levels of the toxic chemical compound polychlorinated biphenol, or PCBs, uh, and they issued a strongly worded advisory against consuming any seafood from the harbor. Uh, so in just one century then, a site that had once been known for supplying food to sustain life for a significant part of the island became a space that has become so toxified that it has become dangerous to swim or fish there. Uh, so the pollution of Pearl Harbor operates as a physical expression of the ravages of colonial militarization, which serves, much like the fences that keep all of the non-authorized personnel away from its shores, as a physical reminder of native dispossession. Yet some recent responses to the growing problems of the harbor's environmental toxicity have focused on the role that native shellfish and pre-colonial aquacultural practices might have to play in reducing toxicity and re-establishing balance to the estuarine environment. So this is a little bit more along the bioremediative lines that uh, we've just been talking about in the earlier panels. Uh, a recent bioremediation project jointly sponsored by the U.S. Navy, Oahu Waterkeepers, and the University of Hawaii have sought to return native oysters to the bay, speculating that these oysters will help filter out dangerous chemicals and help restore the bay to a place that will provide, quote, fishable, drinkable, swimmable water. Uh, based on similar experiments using oysters to filter water in New York Harbor, Chesapeake Bay, and the Gulf of Mexico, the Pearl Harbor Project focuses on restoring two species of native oysters to the bay, 
uh, the Hawaiian oyster, uh, Dendostria sandivicensis, and the black-lipped pearl oyster, uh, the Pinctada margaritifera. Uh, so these are the oysters that once grew in abundance in the section of the bay originally called Waimomi, or Pearl Waters, uh, the site from which Pearl Harbor derives its name. But while these oysters and their pearls have remained embedded in both the Hawaiian and English language place names for the region, uh, and they recur as a trace through those images of the pearly shells, right, and the shells of Eva in that song that I just played, um, the oysters themselves have largely disappeared from the bay by the mid 20th century. Um, long before the full impact of the toxic byproducts of the US military presence had made themselves known, uh, the sediment laden runoff caused by dredge harvesting, deforestation, and plantation agriculture had led to the destruction of the area's oyster colonies. By 1941, the actual number of pearl producing oysters in the harbor had already been dramatically reduced by settler colonial practices dating back to the early 19th century. So in this context, uh, the project's focus on repopulating indigenous oyster species connects the promise of bioremediation to the pro uh, project of cultural restoration. The health of the oyster species within the <laughs> estuarine environment emphasizes the profound entanglement of both land and ocean environments an interrelationship that gets disrupted by concepts of private property that rely upon the conceptual alienability of the land and sea. Uh, so while oyster colonies may be able to operate as a source of bioremediation by filtering out some of the toxic materials out of Pearl Harbor, um, each oyster can filter about 20 gallons of water per day, um, they nevertheless continue to be threatened by runoff sediment and pollution from the land, as well as man-made topographical changes like dredging. Um, as Rhiannon Tererui Chandler Iao, who's the executive director of Oahu Waterkeepers, observes, the Oyster Project will not provide a silver bullet in terms of solving the problem of all water pollution on the island. However, focusing on the fate of the oysters is particularly useful for drawing attention to the ways that, quote, the water is polluted because we're not taking care of what we do on land, and what we do on land is affecting the water, end quote. Uh, this holistic attitude towards resource management reflects Kanaka Maui systems of environmental stewardship. Under, unlike the industrial agricultural practices that sought to reshape the lands and divert waterways to serve the needs of plantations, traditional Kanaka Maui agricultural practices were designed around the flow of water from the upland mountain to the sea, using the already existing natural environment as the framework for crop cultivation and aquaculture. Uh, these self-sustaining ahupua'a, which are those sections of land running from the mountain to the sea, uh, form the basic units of land division uh, in Hawaii before the Great Mahele of 1848, which is when the land was commodified and sold off and leased in parcels. Uh, so these are these, these big sections here are the moku, or the divisions, and each one of those moku have smaller ahupua'a, as you can see there. Um, where was I? Oh, so after, after the Great Mahele, the land was sold off and leased. Uh, and unlike the plantation agriculture that sought to remake and reshape Hawaiian land to accommodate the needs of a global capitalist market, uh, agriculture that was built around this ahupua'a system instead emphasized the unique ecological balance of the local landscape. So instead of trying to make the land produce things for a global market, this kind of system really focused on what the land was already doing in order to create agriculture uh, to sustain the people living there. Um, in particular, these methods provide a vivid example of how, uh, as Richard Kekuni Blaisdell, John Kehoe Lake, and Heilani K. Chang note, uh, a healthy watershed regulates water flows and filters sediments and pollutants while providing the essential nutrients for spawning fish and nursery habitats near the shorelines. So in this sense, Kanaka Mali practices around agriculture, aquaculture, and environmental stewardship performs its own filtration process that supports the oyster's ability to thrive downstream. By contrast, modern disruptions to this ecosystem, which include rerouting streams and rivers to irrigate plantations, clearing land to build housing development and hotels, dredging the base to accommodate warships, cargo ships, and cruise liners, uh, create the most significant potential to limit the oyster's bioremediative project. In other words, it is the very conditions of settler colonial occupation that continue to contribute to the ecological degradation of the Bay, even as awareness and concern around the widespread and generational effects of this environmental damage has improved. Um, while none of the primary stakeholders in this oyster project, at least in official media reports, have directly broached the question of Hawaiian sovereignty, uh, their focus on the symbiotic relationship of land and marine environments centers around the question of land stewardship. 
the question of who is authorized to serve as a caretaker or custodian of the land uh, implicitly highlights the way that such stewardship has, under settler forms of land management, been both divided against itself and misused. Chandler Iaz hoped that oysters will, quote, become the thing that gets us to the table so we're able to talk to people about the actual sources of water pollution, end quote, implies that far from being the end of the remediative project, the oyster project may serve as a beginning for people to start thinking about the long lasting and integrated environmental effects of settler colonial development. In a similar vein, uh, master navigator Nainoa Thompson of the Hokulea uh, hoped that the project would serve as quote, a symbolic and real moment in time where he sees a, a shifting from this chronic letting go of all of our natural resources and this kind of destructive pathway, end quote framing the projects in terms of his hopes, not only for what it might be able to do for the Bay, but for how it might engender a broader paradigm shift in terms of relating to the land. Uh, yet even as Chandler, Eyal, and Thompson's gesture towards the need to rethink these systems of land and property management uh, in terms of interconnectionness instead of alienation, other pronouncements of the project rhetorically foreclose on these more radically system changing possibilities by foregrounding the role of the U.S. Navy and the state of Hawaii as the primary custodians and caretakers of the bay. Uh, in a statement covered by multiple media outlets, Captain Jeff Bernard, uh, the commanding officer of Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, noted that, quote, our partnership with Oahu Waterkeepers on this oyster remediation project is a great example of Navy's initiative of improving and taking care of our environment, unquote. Uh, Corey Campora, the Navy's natural resources manager, further explains that the project will work to, quote, further the Navy's environmental stewardship activities in Pearl Harbor and hopefully lead to long lasting positive effects on the harbor through sustained augmentation of oyster beds, end quote. Uh, so Bernard and Campora's framings of the project are largely delimited to the space of Pearl Harbor itself, which is both rhetorically and materially asserted as being under the ultimate jurisdiction and control of the U.S. Navy. So on the one hand, it's a reminder that the Navy enjoys complete jurisdiction over the harbor in ways that allow the researchers and project managers to seed oysters in sections of the bay that have been restricted to public access. Yet, on the other hand, it is also a reminder of the way that such control is ultimately delimited by naval jurisdiction. Uh, so that is, even if the Navy has control over the space of the bay, uh, in ways that allow them to provide the conditions for oysters to thrive, so nobody can take the oysters, they can't be disturbed, um, the state that the Navy serves must also work to prevent extraction and development projects upland whose effects on the watershed may cancel out or otherwise negate the efforts downstream. This level of protection would require a serious and intentional rethinking of the construction and engineering projects that are necessary to supporting the island's urban population, the tourist industry that brings in over several million people per year, as well as the military forces currently stationed on the island. Right. So while bioremediation practices like the Pearl Harbor Oyster Project thus have the potential to improve conditions in the Bay, the long-term sustainability of such plans require a reckoning with, or at least an accounting for, the environmental impact of the broader project of militarized settler colonialism itself. Because without a serious engagement with the broader paradigm shift implicit within these environmental activists attempt to draw attention to the profound interconnectedness of the watershed, waterways and the over, um, overall environmental health of the islands, the project of cleaning up and detoxifying Pearl Harbor will never be complete. In order for the harbor and all who depend upon it to thrive, perhaps we should decenter the desires of the humans in this process and instead consider the oyster, whose liminal position and function at the space where the shore meets the sea indicates our interdependence and interrelationship with the pearly shells that are not simply setting the scene for romantic love, but are rather inviting us into a deeper and more complex relationship with the land. Thank you.